Welcome to PetX Talks, pet experts empowering pet parents. Pet parents deserve expert knowledge and inspiration directly from pet experts. The topics will range from history to innovation, from health to safety, from training to philosophy, and from experiences to inspiration. The pet experts range from veterinarians to researchers, authors to historians, organizations to individuals, and anyone with important information and inspiration for the pet world. We all want to do the best we can for our pets and the pet world. PetX Talks, the experts who give them, and the topics they share will help us achieve that. Are you ready to be empowered? Then join us for a PetX Talk. This PetX Talk is brought to you by Pet World Media Group, your partner in all things pet media. Additional funding and considerations provided by Pet World Insider, Dogwise, and Life is Pawfect. Welcome, I'm Dr. Ken Tudor, also known as the Dog Dietitian. And as a provider of alternative nutrition programs for dogs, I've really become interested in the trends in pet food that have occurred and, and, and do occur. And I don't restrict that to the alternative programs uh, that I'm involved with. I'm also very, very interested in the trends in the commercial uh, dog food and pet food industry. So much so that I've delved into the history of commercial pet food, and I would like to share that with you all today. Our journey starts about over 150 years ago in 1860, when a US um, electrician by the name of James Spratt sought to increase his business opportunities for his lightning rod uh, production in England. While walking the docks of Liverpool, he noticed sailors feeding stray dogs hardtack. For those of you who don't know, hardtack is a biscuit, cracker type of thing made from flour, water, and sometimes salt, and was used as rations for military personnel um, in, the, in the Navy and uh, the Army. Um, isn't used that much today. But as if struck by lightning himself, James Spratt said, wow, why don't I make a hardtack for dogs? And he did just that. He came out with what he called the patented meat fibrin dog cake. The English gentlemen loved this product as a supplement to the food for their sporting dogs. It was so popular and he did so well, he decided that he wanted to expand and come back to the US. So in 1870, he thought, hmm, where is the crowd for my expensive product? And at that time in America, the show crowd, the dog show crowd was beginning to expand. So he targeted that market. He was the first to take out an ad in the very first American Kennel Club magazine and became, again, very successful in the US. So successful, his brand lasted until uh, 1960 when it was bought by General Mills. In 1910, another family uh, got into the dog biscuit uh, craze, if you will. The Bennetts, who owned a bakery in New York, uh, developed a biscuit that looked just like a dog bone. They called it the Maltoid at first, then they changed the name to the Maltoid Milk Bone, and now it's simply known as the Milk Bone, and we all know how popular that brand is. Um, that franchise was sold to Nabisco in 1931 and just recently sold to Del Monte and Milkbone has 21, 28 varieties of product available today. So up until the 1920s, the dog food industry was, uh, commercial dog food, was defined by Spratt and Bennett's products. There were no others. It was a pricey product so the market was limited and it had its problems. Packaging technology at that time limited the shelf life. So consumers would go home, open the box, and would find that it was often rancid and spoiled. But that changed during the Roaring Twenties. If you'll remember, the Roaring Twenties was a great surge in economic uh, prosperity in the United States. So people became um, more um, open to purchasing dog food rather than feeding from the table. The Chapel Brothers, who had great success selling canned horse meat in Europe, tried to duplicate the same thing in the United States. And so they brought their product called Kennel Ration to the streets of Chicago and met again with great success until the public outcry against slaughtering horses for dog food. 
It was so vociferous that they decided not to fight it and switch to a dry formula that did not meet with nearly the success. Um, and so that uh, franchise was, was purchased by Quaker Oats, which took the Kennel Ration name, and many of you recognize that name, to the heights that it later uh, uh, met. Now, Kennel Ration is pretty much reduced to memorabilia on eBay. In 1925, another gentleman came out with a dry food called Gaines Dog Meal. His name was Clarence Gaines, and he was a pointer breeder who was used to feeding his pointers from the table. He didn't like the expense of doing that, and so he came up with this product, which is basically a dehydrated food that, once reconstituted with water, was more of a balanced diet. Uh, he remarked that his dogs actually looked better on his Gaines dog meal than from the table scraps. And he was one of the first to be concerned about complete nutrition. His business was successful and he sold it to General Foods in 1943. Following this, this idea of balanced nutrition, a veterinarian from Connecticut took it one step further. Leon Whitney said, not only does it have to be complete, it has to be scientifically balanced. And he came out with Ration, which again, another popular 20s product um, that was sold to Quaker Oats. What we have in the Roaring Twenties is this, this, this economic prosperity and an interest in commercial food. And then came the crash of 28, the stock market crash, which brought on the Great Depression. So 25% unemployment in the United States. Uh, people did not, their economic wealth had been destroyed, did not have the money to spend for um, food that they had. So Fido and uh, Sylvester suffered greatly from the lack of table scraps. Um, and there was just a malaise, as you all know, in the uh, American economy. But that didn't mean that the dog food industry didn't flourish because some things were happening. Because no one was purchasing produce, we had all kinds of agricultural uh, materials that were very, very inexpensive. We also had plants that were idled much of the time. Well, we put together ingredients and we put together people with the ability to produce these products and we have the advent of co-packaging, which is the, still the standard today where one plant can make many, many brands. So any enterprising entrepreneur during the 30s could give these uh, co-packers a label or a bag with a label and have dog food produced for them under their name. To show you how extensive this was, 12 plants in 1930 were producing 221 proprietary brands of canned food. So now we have, uh, as we came out of the Depression, uh, co large quantities of commercial pet food, a growing need and want for them, so that sales by the beginning of the war in 1941 were 50 million nationwide, and 90% of that was canned food. Still for the affluent, uh, the average uh, Sylvester and Fido was still uh, scavenging and eating from the table. And the war years weren't particularly good for those folks either, because several things happened. Um, Pet food was declared a non-essential use of metals during the metal rationing of the war effort. So the canned food industry was completely decimated. Some other things that were occurring were the men were off to war, the women were in the factories, and so um, we didn't have as many family meals, less scraps for Fido and Sylvester. Um, our country became more reliant on processed foods, which I'll deal with a little bit more. But some things happened after the war that just caused an explosion for commercial dog food. Manufacturing that had been geared towards military use was now freed to be used for peacetime purposes. And the plant efficiencies that increased productivity meant that we could produce massive amounts of products very cheaply. TVs became affordable. Wash machines became affordable. Automobiles became more affordable than they ever had been. The military innovations of the war also meant that we had other affiliated industries that were taking this technology and creating business opportunities. What that meant was explosive job opportunities. Also that was happening during this time 
was we needed a population to fill those jobs, and we got it. Over 12.2 million GIs returned from overseas and were granted the GI Bill of Rights. This gave them the opportunity to get assistance to go to college and mortgage assistance to buy houses. So now we had a large educated workforce with unlimited employment opportunities and increased disposable income. So some demographic things happened that would spark the commercial pet food revolution. We could now move from the cities to the suburbs with housing affordable, automobiles affordable, and indeed that was the spread of the American population. And our lifestyle changed when we got into the suburbs. No longer was the corner market the center of our universe. Now we had supermarkets with massive amounts of meat, massive amounts of processed food, massive amounts of, of fresh produce. Um, fast food chains came, came into the forefront. Ray Kroc and others bought small mom and pa restaurants like Mr. and Mrs. McDonald's, and you know the rest of the story. And so you put all three of these together, the large supermarkets, the large fast food chains, and this obsession with processed food. Campbell Soup invented Swanson TV dinners. Um, we had fish sticks. We had all kinds of frozen processed food that came to the forefront. Again, another demand for agricultural goods. Uh, this increased agricultural demand also meant increased agricultural scraps. So we now had meat scraps from slaughterhouses. We had grain scraps from grain mills. And we had all these scraps from food processing plants like TV dinner, um, Orida potato, and hamburger helper. And those companies that purchased those earlier uh, dog foods that I mentioned to you took advantage of it and started making dog food. But in 1957, a miracle happened as far as commercial food preparation. Ralston Purina invented the extruded process for dry food. What this meant was we could take all those agricultural scraps, we could put them in a pressure cooker, and we could bring them to a molten fluid, if you will, shoot them through a hot pipe called an extruder, and pop this fluid into lightweight dry kibble. It revolutionized um, the pet food industry. To give you an idea, let's look at those figures from 1945 to 1960, pet food sales accounted for 200 million in yearly sales. 60% was canned, 40% was dry. Pet food still accounted for a substantial amount of grocery volume, 2% as a matter of fact. But if we fast forward to 2013, after these many years of the extrusion process, last year, American pet owners spent 21 and a half billion not million, dollars a year on pet food. 70% dry, 30% wet. So you can see that the impact that the extruded process had on commercial pet food. And you can see the changes in America that completely changed this industry. But I, we always want to take time, and I want to take time, to reflect on the people that preceded that and gave the opportunity for this to happen so that Fido and Sylvester are no longer eating from the table or scavenging the neighborhood. Hi, we're here with Dr. Ken Tudor after his wonderful talk, The History of Pet Food, sitting down to ask a few extra questions about his presentation. Dr. Ken, I wanted to ask you how the dietary changes of America impacted the pet food industry as it developed? That's a great question, and, and I really meant to, to talk a little bit more about processed foods, um, and I'd like to take that opportunity now. Um, spam, which had been invented in the 1930s, um, didn't really take off until the war years when 80% of their sales went to the military and 20% was here at home. And that gave the Americans an opportunity to really enjoy the luxury of processed food and the advantages of processed food. Uh, so that when the men came home and the economy boomed, we now had this hankering for processed food. And today, if you look at, you go into any supermarket, almost all the center aisles are dedicated toward processed foods. The other thing that happened that I only again briefly mentioned was the fast food nation. 
which completely changed our dietary habits. We had more disposable income and we could spend that, but we didn't want to spend it in the kitchen. We wanted more free time. And the fast food nation, of course, changed everything. And if you think about it, what isn't food, pet food in a can or a bag fast food? So we took that same concept and moved it to our dogs as opposed to cooking the meals um, that we were uh, previously. Well, I also thought it was interesting how you talked about the war and its impact. I wanted to ask you to kind of expound upon that because it really had a tremendous impact in many different areas. It did. Um, it, it, it's, you can't overstate the economic prosperity that happened to America after the war. And it was that prosperity, it was those demographic changes, it was the move to the suburbs. And all of this was made possible because of the um, the military effort and the ability now to produce goods so much cheaper, make them more affordable, make people's lives so much different that it truly impacted um, the way we live. And, and I think people don't appreciate uh, how the military affects our lives and how um, inventions with regards to the military and even space exploration. We owe Tang to NASA. And so these things really do have an effect and the a culture isn't separate from its innovations. They kind of meld together. Sure, sure. Well, also, as you talk about the technology aspect of it, the advances that we have seen throughout society have and continue ha to have a tremendous impact on the commercial pet food industry. Share a little bit more about that. Yeah, well, I mean, look where we've come from. We've come from uh, a milk bone that would go rancid in a package. Uh, now we have uh, bags that we can put dog food in that will keep much, much longer and preserve some of the nutrients. Um, the whole canned food industry has changed. Um, as I mentioned, the extrusion process, which was in 1957 very rudimentary with regards to Walston Purina, now gives us the ability to do marvelous things with dry food. We can pop them into any shape we want. Uh, we can make them look like uh, uh, human food. We can, we can, you know, just alter them to make them more appealing to the person who really buys the food, and that is the human, not the pet. I want to say thank you to Dr. Ken Tudor for taking the time to share with us the history of pet food and thank all of you for joining us here on PetX Talks. Thank you for joining us for this PetX Talk. To learn more information about Dr. Ken Tudor, visit hearthstonehomemade.com. Funding for PetX Talks is provided by Pet World Media Group, your partner in all things pet media. Additional funding and considerations for PetX Talks is provided by Pet World Insider, taking you inside the world of pets. Visit PetWorldInsider.com for more radio interviews and expert articles and videos. Dogwise Publishing, all things dog. For all of your dog book needs, visit Dogwise.com. Life is Poffect, a gift book a whimsical collection of themed dog portraits accompanied by wit and wisdom by The Pawtographer. Visit thepawtographer.com. For more information and other excellent PetX Talks, visit petxtalks.com. This has been a Pet World Media Group production.